the Gospel according to St. John, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in, because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it, heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came into the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far off from land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there, with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. Now this was the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, Follow me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. Amen. All right. I have a question for you. What is the story of your life about? We communicate always through stories. That's what we do. If I were to ask you, tell me about how your day has been, right? You have to tell me a story in order to explain how your day has gone, in order to uh, understand complex ideas. So often we read books, which tell us stories about those complex ideas. We watch movies, which tell us with images and stories what it is that uh, the, the authors wish to convey to us. All of our learning is bound up in stories. And even our self-understanding, who we believe ourselves to be, we have to tell through a story. Because it's not simply enough to say, well, uh, hey, I'm Kevin McLean. And uh, that's true, by the way, of me, not you. Uh, but unless you got the same name, that's pretty cool. So, um, But you are not simply encapsulated with a name. It's not enough to say who you are and what you're like. And to describe the things that you've done and the places that you've been is not enough to describe who you are. 
but your life must be told in a story. How do you tell that story to yourself? And what is it about? Where do you imagine that you're at in that story? This is important because how you understand that story, what you imagine it to be, will define your life. And that, that friends, is a sacred thing. It's something that God himself believes is his work and not yours, to define your life. And even he will use a story. And we can see this very, very clearly today, that our Lord writes a better story than we do. This uh, passage in Scripture, it doesn't seem like much. It is, uh, in a sense, Peter getting out of trouble, right? Peter has denied the Lord three times. The Lord uh, was crucified. And then we've heard of this resurrection. And now Jesus is appearing to people. And this is changing everything. It's changing the way that they understood the world that they lived in, their lives, the significance of everything that came before. It's writing a new ending. Because just a few days prior, they were willing to say, it was all for nothing. And for many of us, we get to places in our lives that because of our sin or our failures, because of the way that we've lived up into now, we're ready to write off our lives as well. We're ready, we're ready to say, hey, you know what? This, is, this might be my story, but it's not a great story. There's no excitement left in my story. There's no hope left in my story. And what I am today, well, it's all downhill from here. And so all of the peak, all of the excitement has come before. But to believe that is to believe that God is finished with you. To believe that the work that God has hoped to accomplish in and through and to and for you is done. It's completed. And it may be true that your forgiveness has been completed in Christ Jesus, but you are here as a living testimony to the work of God. Now, most people want to write a story in a particular way. They want to tell the story of their lives uh, in it, something that we would call a linear progression. That I started off down here. I was uh, cold and naked and screaming. And uh, there were some people who helped me. But eventually, it just got better and better. That throughout my life, I was educated and I grew. And I stayed healthy and things went well. And I got a job and that job led to another job and led to another job, which led to retirement. And before too long, uh, it looks like a Corona commercial. That this is what we all hope for in some way. That our, that our life story is somewhat uneventful. We all know what the corona thing is. Like, it's good. You may not like beer, but we all like the idea of being warm, especially uh, in the late winter uh, and having our feet in the sand. I'm not saying it's the worst thing that you could want, but it isn't a very exciting story, is it? I mean, if that were your story today, maybe today would be looking up, right? But if you were to say, well, what did you do with the rest of your life? Well, I just sat down, and it was warm, and so I stayed there. That's not a story that I think anyone wants to live. And yet we imagine it to be our goal. We imagine it to be the end that we should be working towards, that we should be trying to create for ourselves, and that if others were smart, they would be doing the same. But God isn't working that way in our lives. And we know that, and we feel it as well. Because our lives are filled with up and ups and downs, incredible uh, hardships and tragedies, difficulties that we didn't foresee, and ways that we respond to them that don't make us look like the hero of our own story. We see that in the gospel reading. J Jesus uh, appears on the beach of a story that should be over. For the disciples, they have screwed up. They have betrayed uh, the Lord. They have turned their back on him in his hour of need. But he has remained faithful. And he's appearing and there are four events that I want to bring up uh, in this reading that are critically important. There are actually more, and I, but we won't have time for them this morning. But I hope that in looking at these connections, which are all here intentionally, they're very, very important. Every word of Scripture is critical, right? You lose one word, you lose a lot. That you might be intrigued enough to go a step further and to look even deeper and see what God has done through His Word. But then to look deeper in your own lives, to imagine the ways that God is tying things together. God is weaving together a story that's more incredible than you ever imagined. And he is doing it uh, very much the way that he has done with the apostles. 
Now, the first thing that uh, I want to point out, the disciples are going to go fishing, which good on them. I love fishing. I'm a big, big fan of fishing. I try to do as much as I can. And it seems like a reasonable course of action, right? Like, you know what? It's been a hard three years of ministry. The boss is away. <laughs> Maybe we could take a break. But really what Peter is saying is that he's going back to fishing. He's not simply going fishing. He's going back to it, which was the family business. He's going back to what he knows. So that even the reports of the uh, resurrection, even as his, his experiences that he has had, they were fleeting enough that he still apparently lived in some state of doubt, in a state of uncertainty, not knowing exactly what it was that God wanted him to do or what God was going to do with the rest of his life. But we see through his actions, rather than his words, basically what he believes. God is done with him. And it's pretty fair because he's announced that he was done with God's Son. And he did that three times on the night of Jesus' arrest and betrayal. He's going back to fishing. His story is over as it concerns Jesus Christ. He is walking away. And this is where we find Peter. On the fishing boat. And they're fishing all night long, catching zilch. This is the first part that I want to point your attention to. Maybe you've heard of this story before. Because this is exactly where Jesus meets Peter the first time, is it not? You see, John, when writing his gospel account, which is very, very different than the others, I love the gospel of John, and I'm a big fan of it in this way. It was written for people who don't know Jesus. So if you feel like, I don't know the Bible really well, I'll tell you what, that's a fantastic place to start with the gospel of John. But he wrote it as a theological gospel, knowing that there were these other gospels out floating around. And in light of that, he doesn't simply uh, write something that stands on its own two feet, but that, meant, uh, that was meant to be compiled together, just as we have it today in the Bible. So he draws from the sources of the other Gospels, and all of those are critically important to his, to his story, because he believes that what God's doing is bigger than one story. He's bringing it all together. And so we see that in the beginning, uh, when they're fishing, this miraculous catch. Jesus stands on the shore, and he says, Hey, have you caught anything? No, I haven't caught anything. Cast your net over the side of your boat, and you will find fish. And a miraculous catch ensues. You can find that in the fifth chapter of Luke, the, first, the fourth verse that John quotes from. This exact same event happens again. And it's meant to do something for us, the same thing that it meant for Peter, to draw our attention to the fact that what God is doing here, it certainly seemed new to Peter, but it was not exactly something new. He was fixing what was broken. He was going back to the beginning and making them re-understand everything that they had gone through. Every doubt that Peter had, every doubt that you have, God will be and is working in your life to make you re-understand those things, to examine them again and say, maybe I didn't have it figured out. That miraculous catch was how Peter came to know that Jesus was the Christ. Now they're hauling in the nets, of course, and it's very strange things happen happens in this. And I'm always surprised that in church everyone is so well behaved that no one chuckles, not even once. Because they're out fishing, and it says that John says, It's the Lord. And the first thing that Peter does is what? Puts his clothes on for he was naked. And like <laughs> I've never gone fishing like that with my buddies. Uh, that's a strange way to fish. So, but that being said, there actually, there's two things for this. This is important. Number one, I'll give, you, I'll give you a factual reason as to why you would fish naked back in the day. Because you're really good friends. And, uh, <laughs> but you only have generally like one piece of clothing. Clothing's important. Clothing's important. And, uh, and it, at the end of the day, you don't want to smell like a fish. So you're going to take that stuff off and then work in your underoos. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah, you're going to need to throw it back on afterwards. But the last time that we see Peter and all of these things that, that we're going to be examining that point us to Peter's denials of Jesus is in the Gospel of Mark, 
which is dictated to a fellow named John Mark by Peter. And Peter uses a, a technique that we see in John all the time, where he speaks about himself without drawing attention to him. And he says this, that after cutting off the ear of the servant Malchus in the Garden of Gethsemane as Jesus is being taken captive, it mentions that someone ran away and was seized by their linen garment and had to leave it behind, and they fled naked. And that person is Peter. That this whole story begins with the naked Peter uh, who is doing everything he can to get away from Jesus as fast as possible. This is why when he comes back and he is going to be accepted uh, later uh, in uh, the residence of Caiaphas, he thinks probably that he can get away with it. Because it's like, hey, didn't you just chop the ear off of that guy that you're standing next to? No, 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 different guy. He was wearing a white cloak. I'm wearing an off-white cloak. I suppose that must have been the rationale. But once he is clothed again, the next place that we see him is where? Around a charcoal fire. There's only two charcoal fires in the Bible. Uh, this one, and the one that he denied Jesus around three times. That comes uh, from the 18th chapter of John. Everything in Peter's life, from the moment that he met Jesus is being tied together into this moment because this moment will define who Peter is. This moment changes everything and it becomes the, the center of the story of his life. I'm sure like you and I, he imagined that it would be the best parts, that it would be the Mount of Transfiguration that defined Peter. Like, ah, I knew the answer when they asked. I'm sure that he imagined that it would be the best things that he had to do for God the most important things that he had to offer his friends or his family. Um, these things would define who he was. But they weren't. Instead, of all of these things, all of his shame, all of his mistakes, all of his cowardice, was all being tied back together by God and Christ, and for a very important reason. You see, when he makes it to shore... He's gathered around that same fire, that same special kind of fire where he denies Christ, and Christ asks him three times, do you love me? And he says this, this is hidden in the language, and so I don't like speaking Greek, um, but it's important. Do you love me more than these? And there's questions about what these are, but I imagine that he's pointing to the best that his life could have been. Miraculous catches of fish, surrounded by his friends, doing the work that he was born, in a sense, to do. Do you love me more than all of this? Is this really the life that you want? Well, he asks you the same question as well. Is this really the life that you want? Do you imagine that everything that God has given to this point is everything that he desires to give? And is this the life that you want to continue to live and to be a part of? He asks uh, that using this word. Do you agape? Do you love by acting? Will you go back to it? No, I love you, Lord. He asks again. Do you love me? Do you agape me? Will you love me through your actions? Will you do what I want you to do? And he says, yes. Yes, I love you, Lord. You know that I love you. And then he's busted up because he's asked a third time. And it's not some magic in the number three. He doesn't say the same thing to him. He says, do you phileo? Do you love me like your brother? Are we family again? And Peter says, yes. Yes. That changes everything. That isn't the end of the story. That's the beginning. You see, Peter imagined that all of this stuff was building up towards a life that would make sense from the beginning. Things were going to go uh, from being rocky in the beginning to being incredible at the end with no ups and downs in between. 
that he was going to go from uh, birth to adulthood and adulthood to retirement uh, on a continuous path of ascension, getting better and doing better and being better. And uh, I'm getting a little bit of reverb down here. <laughs> um, but instead, the worst parts of his life are brought into new focus and meaning as he encounters Christ in redemption. And this is an important lesson for you and me, and you must know this so that you do not write the wrong, st <laughs> the wrong story for yourself that you do not misunderstand who you were meant to be and what your life was supposed to be. Your life is defined as Peter's life was, not by your perfection, not by the, the smooth character of it, not by the right things that you did or are going to do, but by the reality that no matter what you have done, Jesus Christ has redeemed it, that he has done what is necessary. God has forgiven you, and that changes everything. And now you are free to live as somebody who is forgiven. Now you are free to begin to write your story again, to look back at all of the past hardships and hurts and pains and difficulties that life has brought to you and that you have brought to life, and to understand them differently. Because they are the miracles that God is working to bring you to himself. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you are the one to write our story. We have not done and been what we should have been in our own eyes. But all of these things you work for good. You are the author of our salvation. Lord, help us to revel in that story. Help us to understand ourselves rightly in Christ Jesus as ones who are forgiven, ones who are saved, Lord, and for that we are a people with a bright future because what you have done for us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.